without delay, please welcome Dr. Mahesh. Thank you, sir. Uh, good evening. This is supposed to be a laid-back experience. So even though I have a podium, I will not be, or trying not to speak ex cathedra uh, from the podium, uh, but uh, there are a few things that might be useful to mention in the context of this extraordinary <coughs> concert that we are going to be exposed to in about less than an hour. 1918, 100 years ago, a very important uh, date in the history, not only of uh, modern Europe, uh, but of the world. And in fact, not only 1918, these very months of uh, October and November uh, will be marked and are already being marked by a series of commemorative events because uh, I guess largely we can sum up those commemorative events during these two months as the end of an old era and the beginning of a new. I might kind of add parenthetically from the beginning here that when we use these terms, I'm not implying that the old is necessarily not worse than the new. One might argue that it's just the reverse, but you can draw your conclusions from that, from what I say. But what happened in 1918, certainly during these two months? Well, first of all, the, the end of the old era was the collapse of uh, at least uh, two major empires in, in, in Europe. One had collapsed the year before, the Russian Empire, and then, of course, the German Empire, and the Austro-Hungarian Empire in the heart of uh, Central uh, Europe. They were replaced by new states, uh, both those empires that I mentioned, the German and particularly the Austro-Hungarian, the Ottoman Empire farther south in the Balkans, were what we call multinational states, or, multi, or classic empires, including a vast majority uh, of, uh, of peoples. And those peoples, already in the course of the 19th century, certainly in the course of World War I, uh, were concerned about what would be their fate after the war, the Great War, would be over. And of course, the Great War did come to an end two weeks later. And we're all going to be celebrating, I would assume, here in the United States, in your churches. Does one still celebrate what we used to call Armistice Day? Uh, and now it's called, what, Remembrance Day? Is this, is this correct? Is, is it taken seriously at all here? It's a national holiday. I know because in Canada, where I come from, we already have to wear poppies. If I were there this week, I would have a, a poppy, a red poppy on me. Uh, and we do take it quite seriously uh, there. And so, yes, that's, going, that's around the corner, 100th anniversary of that 11th hour, 11th day of the 11th month. Uh, so what happened? Those empires disappeared, and we had the creation of several new states, the Baltic states up in the north, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, Finland, by the way, also even farther north than that. Uh, Poland was reconstructed. Uh, Several other states were expanded in size, among them Romania, somewhat related to what we're talking about, what we're going to hear this evening. Uh, Yugoslavia, totally brand new state. Uh, and Czechoslovakia. And in fact, the Declaration of Independence of Czechoslovakia uh, took place on October 28th, uh, 1918, which is tomorrow, and which is a major celebration uh, in actually what was what was Czechoslovakia? Czechoslovakia doesn't exist anymore as a single state, uh, but uh, uh, both sides, both halves of the former Czechoslovakia, that is the Czech Republic and Slovakia, are in fact recognizing uh, this, uh, the foundation of a state that brought them uh, their independence. Well, what was Czechoslovakia? Well, actually, in one sense, it was a small version of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. That is, it was a multinational state. By no means 
uh, were all the citizens of this new state of Czechoslovakia, the Czechoslovaks, which of course doesn't exist. There's no such thing as Czechoslovaks. There are Czechs and there are Slovaks. But even the Czechs and the Slovaks uh, barely together, barely together formed a majority of the population. Why? Because there were well over 2 million ethnic Germans, or more properly Austro-Germans, living in particular in the western parts of the country. Uh, there was close to a million Magyars, or one can say Hungarians, living primarily in the eastern, southeastern portion of this uh, new country. There was a, a very large number of uh, Jews uh, living in this new state of Czechoslovakia. And then finally there were, was a people, an East Slavic people called uh, uh, Karpato Rusins. So the population of this new state was uh, complex, uh, and in that sense, it reflected in many ways the former Austro-Hungarian Empire. And in fact, Czechoslovakia was based or created with some portion of what was the Austrian half of the Austro-Hungarian Empire and some portion which was the Hungarian half, quote-unquote, of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and they were from more or less four distinct regions in this new state of Czechoslovakia. There was Bohemia in the far west, Moravia, Moravia together with Silesia uh, to the east, to the east of that Slovakia, and finally to the east of Slovakia, uh, what is known as Subcarpathian Rus, Podkarpatska Rus. And what is bringing us here this evening uh, is an effort on the part of organizations in North America that are in particular concerned uh, with Carpeto Rusins and their descendants living in this country. And uh, we are celebrating for you the creation of Czechoslovakia. I don't know if Czechs or Slovaks are doing that, uh, but uh, we are helping to do that and reminding our Czech and Slovak friends that they were not the only peoples who created the state of Czechoslovakia. They like to speak about them as being statotvorni narodi, uh, that is, state-creating peoples. Well, actually, they were not two state-creating peoples. They were three state-creating peoples of this Czechoslovakia, and that is Czechs, Slovaks, and uh, uh, Karpetho-Rusins. What was the relationship, in some ways, of the new ruling elite of this young country, and that new ruling elite was made up primarily of Czechs, though there were also Slovaks as part of the governing ruling elite, in particular those Slovaks who uh, were, had strong feelings and were in favor of the idea of Czechoslovak unity, and not all Slovaks were in favor of it, uh, but uh, there were some, and they played a role, a very important role, uh, in, the, uh, in the governing elite of this new state. And in fact, I understand that we have here uh, the grandson of one of these slow, pro-Czechoslovak uh, Slovak leaders who was uh, for a long time even prime minister of the country, Milan Hoxha, and so I understand that this is Milan Hoja's grandson sitting uh, right here, and we're very pleased that you joined us uh, uh, this evening. Subcarpathian Rus, the Czechs looked at this in particular. The Czech elite looked at this, and the Czech, uh, not only governing elite, but intellectual elite, they looked at Subcarpathian Rus, this land out in the east, as some kind of uh, exotic place far from industrialized parts of Bohemia and, Mar uh, and Moravia, and much more even exotic and wild and different uh, uh, than Slovakia. And Subcarpathian Rus in itself became a source of inspiration to many uh, Czech creative artists. So we have writers like Ivan Olbrach, uh, Vladislav Vanschura, all of whom distinguished uh, into writers within this new state of Czechoslovakia, who, who, some of whose works were drawn specifically and based on themes 
from uh, uh, Subcarpathian Rus. They used it as their source of, inf uh, uh, of inspiration, not only writers, uh, but Czech artists, uh, Czech architects. You have to remember this was a new country, Czechoslovakia. It was swept up by the idea of change, rejection of the old empire. Uh, this was the era of international style architecture, derived largely from Mies van der Rohe, applied by Czechs in building new buildings. Now, most of Bohemia and Moravia and a significant part of a significant part of uh, Slovakia either had architectural buildings from the Austrian times and Hungarian times. And so the Czechs, Czech architects in particular, looked at Subcarpathian Rus as a kind of terra incognita uh, where they could carry out their architectural experiments. And because the Czechoslovak government was very important, concerned with, uh, with improving the standards uh, in Subcarpathian Rus, uh, and that included as well choosing because they needed a administrative center for each of the four regions of the country. So Prague became the, 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 the kind of capital of Bohemia, if you will, as well as capital of the country. Brno uh, became the, the administrative capital of uh, Moravia Silesia, Bratislava for Slovakia, and for Subcarpathian Rus, they chose uh, Ushorod. And Ushorod had to be transformed to, to make it look like a serious entity in this new country. And so they sent out all these Czech architects who were, who were already experimenting uh, uh, with these new forms of the international school, or what they would call functionalism. It's actually quite boring and uninspired to my mind, but nonetheless, this was, this was the modern world. And so now we plop, Ushorod is now transformed, and they actually they, they took a section of the city and just rebuilt it from scratch. All of those buildings you can still see today. They survived World War II, they survived the Soviets, and they survived the Ukrainian government. Um, and it's a kind of window into interwar uh, Czechoslovakia. And aside from, as I say, uh, writers, or painters, architects, even photographers, very several many uh, uh, Czech photographers, Karol Plitska, uh, went out there and did a whole series of photographs of this, this exotic region for them, including a man named Rudolf Hulka, whose photographs were only discovered in the Slavonic Library in Prague about five or six years ago. Uh, phenomenal photographs, some of them even in color, that were done in the uh, 1920s and 1930s. And you're gonna see some of them tonight because they accompany, uh, they're going to be shown as an accompaniment to the, uh, one of the works that we're going uh, to hear. Now, I mentioned the interest of Czechs in this exotic, very exotic land of Subcarpathian Rus in the far east, I didn't mention Slovaks. Slovaks in general actually were not interested in Subcarpathian Rus. Because after all, they themselves were at a lesser developed level than the Czechs, not terribly much far than the level of Subcarpathian Rus, and at least if anything, they could feel a little bit superior to, to the farther east. So we don't have, with by no means are there even remotely the same number of people from the creative intelligentsia uh, in Slovakia who were interested in Subcarpathian Rus as were Czechs. That then brings us to the musical program of this evening. Uh, I'm not a uh, musicolo musicologist, uh, and I'm well, I shouldn't say I'm not a musician, but nonetheless, uh, I do know something about music. Uh, but uh, I'm going to speak more, more in the musicological sense or the general uh, cultural sense. The program that was chosen this evening is going to really focus on one work, and I will get to that in a second. Or it's the main work, it's the excuse for being here. Um, but the, the program is divided into two parts. In the first part, uh, they've chosen some other works 
from Central Europe. Notice I don't use the term Eastern Europe. Central Europe. Uh, so we're going to hear a piece by uh, Ionesco, George Ionesco, uh, the Romanian composer, and also uh, by the Hungarian composer uh, Kodai uh, from the Hari Janos suite. Both of these works have clearly, as you're going to hear, Central European themes uh, in them. But the third work during the second half is something called the Jalm Zemje Podkarpatske, or Jalm in Slovak, that's the Czech, Jalm Zemje Podkarpatske in Slovak. In English, the Psalm of the Subcarpathian Land, the Psalm of the Subcarpathian land. That is a, the actual translation, though it's quite interesting that the Slovak translation uh, kind of plays down the farther east. So when a recording of this work was issued by the famous Czechoslovak <clears throat> recording company Suprafon, uh, the English notes that went with it uh, they called it the Psalm of the Carpathian Country. Not the Psalm of the Subcarpathian Land, but the Psalm of the Carpathian Country. And all of the description talked about Slovakia. And this work is not inspired by Slovakia even remotely. Uh, it is inspired, how is it inspired? It was, it was inspired by one of these Czechs who, that I've just spoken about, looked toward this eastern land and uh, his name was Yaroslav Zatlokal. He was actually uh, uh, born in Silesia, uh, a teacher, a secondary school teacher, middle school, senior high school teacher, who found employment, though he came from Silesia and worked in Moravia, he found employment in Bratislava. So the entire 1930s, he worked as a middle school teacher in Bratislava. But aside from being a teacher, he was a writer, he published several collections of poetry, uh, and a publicist, and a civic activist. In 1936, he published a collection of poetry called Vitas uh, Polonim, more or less, The Wind from the Mountain Pastures. A uh, collection of poetry in 1936, and one of the longest poems within this collection was called the Jean Zemne Podkarpatske, that is, the Song of the Subcarpathian Land. So much for the libretto, because the second half, the work that we're going to hear is a cantata for orchestra and chorus. So the libretto for the, uh, the cantata is really the, uh, this poem written by Zatloka. The composer of the music is a man named uh, Yevhen Evgen Suchon. Uh, Suchon was actually Slovak. By the way, never was in Subcarpathian Rus. Uh, however, his, uh, his younger brother was a student of this Zatloka. And one day, the younger brother was so moved by his teacher that he went to, he, he bought a copy of this collection of poetry, brought it home, and left it on the table. And Suchan, the young composer, picks it up and glances at it, and he comes across this poem uh, called The Psalm of the Subcarpathian Land. He's inspired by it, starts to think about how the text of this poem can be made into a cantata, very specifically. He liked the structure of the poem, which made it easy for him to create, in his mind, a cantata. And so that was really the origin uh, of, uh, of how this, uh, this work came about. Suchon, by this time, was a young Slovak composer. He was a student of uh, Vítězslav Novák, and Novák, in turn, was inspired by Smetana and Dvořák, uh, 
So those three composers were really writing in the, in the manner of late 19th century romantic national inspired orchestral music, beautiful melodies, uh, many of them drawn from folk melodies, whether they be Czech, in the case of Smetana and Dvořák, or um, Slovak in the case of Novak. Uh, all of you know one of these melodies because one of them was, one composer that is Dvořák was not inspired by a local Czech folk, ton, folk song. He was inspired by a, something in, he heard in America because he spent two years living in Nebraska uh, and, uh, and allegedly heard some blacks singing some song. Those of you in music would probably know exactly what I'm referring to because then he used it in the Ninth Symphony called From the New World. Ba -na -na, la -na -na. Ba -na 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 -na. So this is, the inspiration can come from various places, not only from Subcarpathian News in the case of Sukhon, uh, but Nebraska in the case of, uh, of Dvoja. But Sukhon, and this is important, though inspired, and he studied with Nova, broke with them in the sense like many composers in the 20th century broke with the musical heritage of the past. We can think of Stravinsky on the eve of World War I. Uh, we can think then of Schoenberg and uh, Alan Berg and von Weber. Uh, melody was out the window, dissonance was in. I mentioned this just to prepare you, uh, and the Czechs were doing this as well. We had people like Janacek, Bohuslav Martinu, already in the 20s and 30s, and in the case of, of uh, Suchan in the Slovakia. For all intents and purposes, this piece of music is heavy and it's harsh. It's strident. It's dissonant. It's quintessential 20th century. The worst century in the history of humanity. <laughs> that is not a joke. And it's going to be reflected in the second half of the program, so I don't want you to be surprised. Why then was this jalm of the Subcarpathian land so appropriate for someone living in the interwar years of the 20th century? Well, Czechs in particular, when they took over this land, one of the things they thought they were doing was saving, saving a fellow Slavic people who lived in poverty, in destitution, as a result of dastardly Hungarian rule for a thousand years. Everything I just said is all in quotes, by the way. Why do I say that? Was there poverty in some parts of Subcarpathian Sub rules? Yes. Was the entire land poverty stricken? No. But the Czechs wanted to feel that they were the big elder brother, helping these poor people. And so they sought out, more often than not, scenes, themes, based on uh, the negative aspect of the, the historical past of this region, and kind of stressed it. Uh, Suchon then decides to write a cantata based on this poem. First thing he does, actually, is he takes the text and he doesn't use the Czech original, but translates it into Slovak. So the cantata, and you're going to hear, actually, because the choir here from Minnesota has been trained to sing it in Slovak. Um, 
and of course many of you will understand it because you can all make a distinction between Slovak and Czech, I'm sure. Uh, the work was actually written in 1938. It was premiered in February of 1938. And whereas it does reflect the poem, and Zat Lokal, the author of the poem, decided to stress the negative aspects of life in Subcarpathian ruse. Though even though we can't say that everything was negative in Subcarpathian Rus during this time, far from it, both before the Czechoslovak regime and after. In many ways, being written in 1938, it did reflect what was going to happen. Because within a few months, by September came the Munich Pact, and within a few, that was the end of Czechoslovakia. It lingered on for six more months, and then we enter into truly dark times, when Bohemia and Moravia are annexed to Nazi Germany as a protectorate. Slovakia becomes a becomes a national state, but closely allied to, and for all intents and purposes, subordinate to uh, Nazi German policy. And Subcarpathian Rus, that fourth land in the Far East, is occupied uh, and returned. I tell my students never to use loaded words like occupied, so I'm striking that right now, excuse me. Uh, Subcarpathian Rus is returned, re-annexed, however you want to call it, to Hungary. So there is no more Czechoslovakia. And World War II, under direct or indirect rule of Nazi Germany, is disastrous. And then the war is over. Czechoslovakia is reconstituted. Subcarpathian Rus is lopped off by Stalin because he wants it for strategic reasons. And then we have 40-odd plus, almost half a century, of communist rule. So we move from Nazi Germany to communist. And in this sense, in this sense, this work by Suchan in 1938, with all this dissonance and really harshness, is almost a kind of foreboding, not necessarily even knowing of what is to come. Then we have the rest of our wonderful 20th century. Except there was a light at the end of the tunnel. And the light at the end of the tunnel is the end of the 20th century. Uh, and the end of the 20th century like the end of the 19th century, or the beginning or ends, are not really related to you know, a date or a number, whether it's 1900 or 2000 or 1800, because those numbers, those dates mean nothing. So the 19th century, for all intents and purposes, ended in 1914, when the, and we call it the long 19th century, when World War I broke out. The 20th century begins in 1914, with the Great War, and they didn't have enough of the Great War, so they had to have a second war. But the, the 20th century, fortunately, was chronologically short because it ended in that date, which began the light, or was the light, at the end of the tunnel, 1989. The fall of communism, the liberation of millions of people without a gunshot being set off, the Yugoslav situation came a little bit later, was truly an anomaly. But for these other lands, not. They had regained their sovereignty as independent states, and that included, uh, and that included uh, Czechoslovakia. Uh, then, of course, in 1993, Czechs and Slovaks decided to separate a model of how things should be done. Again, without a shot being fired, each of them had to have their own state for a while, just like when you have your children and 
they become adolescents, they have to leave the house because they got to get out on their own. And then 10, 15 years later, you're stuck with them once again. And many of you in this room are probably spending as much money on your adult children as you are on yourselves, but that's a, a different story. So in, in that particular sense, the Czechs and Slovaks actually now have better relations than they've ever had before. Uh, I was just in Preshov last week, and, and I saw uh, the equivalent of, what is it, what are these things, America has talent, or you know those kind of shows on TV? So now for the first time, I've actually seen Czechoslovakia has talent. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I haven't seen this name for a long time, and yet it's back, <laughs> because now they're cooperating together. <laughs> so, very interesting. The other thing that happened in 1989 was the rebirth of peoples whose existence was denied by communism, by communist rule, primarily in this case by the Soviet Union. And among those peoples were Karpato Rusins. When the communists came to power in 1945, aside from lopping off from Czechoslovakia and taking Subkarpatian Rus and making it part of Soviet Ukraine, the Soviet Union, it then banned the Carpathian Rusin nationality, not only within the boundaries of the Soviet Union that they had held, but also wherever Carpathian Rusins existed in other countries of Central Europe, whether in Poland, whether in, still in Northeastern Slovakia, in Hungary, etc. Nationality banned. Language doesn't exist. 1989 comes, there is a rebirth. And from that time until today, the Carpathian Rusins now in Europe and here in America are uh, actually uh, flourishing. So what we can leave then from here, or I will end on this note, and I guess also maybe entertain any questions if there are, the short 20th century is gone. Let's be hopeful that it will not be repeated. We don't need any more massive wars in which millions and millions of men and women, combatants and civilians are killed. We don't need any more artificial famines as was created by Stalin in Ukraine, or the Armenians, or what has happened, for that matter, also in China, which had the biggest famine of 15 million being killed. We don't need totalitarianism. And most important, we need recognition as a result of a basic human right of all peoples living in the world, regardless of whether they have their own state. And among those stateless peoples are Carpeto Rusins. And tonight is a gift from American Carpeto Rusins to one of those states in which they lived. And notice that state came and went, just like all states come and go, but the people remain. Thank you.